Hello everyone. This lecture supplements uh, chapter four of the textbook, which uh, covers the project infrastructure. Our learning objectives for this chapter are for you to be able to describe the planning phase, a phase which starts after project uh, authorization, describe the project uh, infrastructure, including the role of the uh, project uh, governance and the project manager. Understand how a project requires internal and external resources. Uh, describe three general categories of uh, procurement contracts. Understand the environment uh, within which project operates and develops a uh, and, and also for you to develop a project charter and and uh, see how it ties to the project plan. After the business case is approved, project planning phase starts. This is when our focus changes from strategic to more tactical issues such as what work exactly needs to be done, who will do it, what other resources will be needed, how long will it take, how much will it cost. As we plan the project, we need to continually ensure that our plans are supporting the project MOV. We also need to plan the project infrastructure its governance and resources. One of the first deliverables that we work on during the planning phase is the project charter. The project infrastructure is uh, documented in the project charter and identifies the project's governance structure and all of the project resources. Let's look at the, the peril in the infrastructure for a city. Uh, a city, its governance is its uh, council. Its infrastructure includes utilities, roads, and public transportation. In, uh, uh, its resources include public works, I, its IT department, its finance department, uh, etc. Organizations typically create an organizational governance structure to set the strategic direction and assess performance. In fact, having the governance structure is a legal requirement for publicly traded companies in the US. Organizational governance authorizes a project after they ensure that it's aligned with the organizational strategy and delivers real value to the organization. Project governance should provide the structure for proper oversight and accountability for the project. Set a clear direction, uh, making a process and ensure that project is adequately resource. This slide depicts how the organizational governance, project governance, and projects are related. Because projects provide a means of implementing an organizational strategy, project governance must ensure that the project aligns with a chosen organizational strategy and provides value. A project steering committee or governance committee has to establish the stakeholder uh, holders uh, roles, monitor progress and ensure that the project has adequate funding and resources. It also defines authority as to what decisions can be made by the project manager and those that must be escalated to a higher level, such as 
the governance committee or to the senior executives. Project stakeholders must have a clear understanding of their authority. For example, who will authorize the acceptance of project deliverables or give approval for the project to continue to the next phase or accept a change to the project scope. The aim is not to create an oppressive bureaucracy, but to empower people to make certain decisions while having a clearly communicated process for escalating issues or problems to a higher level of authority when it's needed and it's appropriate. The project manager must play many roles. First, the project manager must play a managerial role that focuses on planning, organizing, and controlling. The project manager, for example, is responsible for developing the project plans, organizing the project resources, and then oversee execution of the plan. The project manager must also perform many administrative functions, including performance reviews of the project team members, uh, project tracking and reporting, and other general day-to-day -day responsibilities. So what are the attributes of a good project manager? Uh, the ability to communicate clearly and effectively is, is paramount. The ability to deal with people and the issues that come, uh, come up. The ability to create and sustain relationship. Uh, the ability to organize. One of the key responsibilities of the project manager is to put together a project team. What skills or knowledge should a project manager consider when selecting a project team? Of course, a project manager strives to acquire the brightest and the best. For that, project, uh, project team members should be chosen based on their uh, technology skills, their business and organizational skills, as well as interpersonal skills. The, these all need to be considered together. If you have the choice of a person with superior technical skills, but very poor interpersonal skills, uh, versus another person with good technical skills and good uh, interpersonal skills, uh, you may consider choosing the, the latter uh, because lack of uh, interpersonal skills may not off offset the advantages of having deep uh, technology knowledge. Projects work within their formal organizations with clear lines of authority, uh, responsibilities, reporting, communications, and decision making. These relationships are formalized through the organization chart and our organizational policies and, and procedures. Projects are microcosms of the overall organization. They require resources and structure. Moreover, these resources, processes, and structure are driven largely by the overall organization, which establishes the rule for availability of resources, reporting relationships, and project uh, roles and responsibilities. Therefore, it's important to understand how the projects fit within the present or within the, the overall or parent organization and how the project itself will be organized. There are three types of organizational structure, and it relates uh, 
as, as we look at projects. On one end of the spectrum, we have the uh, functional organization where functional managers have the control of all resources. And a project manager would be reporting to one of the functional managers, while other project staff members are borrowed from other functional managers. Functions may be areas such as uh, hosting, uh, telecommunication, uh, database, uh, support and, and testing or cybersecurity, any of these uh, functions. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have a project-based organization where project managers are reporting to the head of the organization. Many organizations are, are somewhere in between as a matrix organization. In this organization, the projects are formed across functions, but projects, uh, project managers as well as functional managers report to the organization, organization head. Projects in a functional organization are based within a particular function and are coordinated through the, the uh, established channels of communications within that organization. So uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of a functional organization? The advantages of this approach include increased flexibility in terms of using the functional, uh, the functions resources, the breadth and depth of knowledge and experience from the functions. Uh, there will be less duplication. For example, three different projects don't approach cybersecurity differently. The, disadvantage, uh, the disadvantages include the uh, authority and responsibility given to the project manager varies greatly uh, by the functional organization. There is usually poor uh, response time uh, because the project staff have functional responsibilities in addition to the project responsibilities. And finally, the communication, uh, communications with other functions is usually poor, uh, which results in difficulties during integration. Sometimes referred to as the pure project organization, the project-based organization, uh, organizational structure supports projects uh, as the dominant form of the business. Typically, a project organization will support multiple projects at one point and integrate uh, project management tools and techniques throughout the organization. Each project is treated as a separate and relatively independent unit within the organization. In general, a group or unit called the Project Management Office, PMO, is responsible for assigning the project manager to the project as well as overseeing the project methodology and project reporting requirements and ensuring that the project remains viable and on track. The project managers have uh, sole responsibility over, uh, uh, over the, uh, uh, their project and its resources, while the parent organization provides uh, governance controls and, and oversight. Both the project manager and project team are typically assigned to a particular project on a full-time basis in this type of organization. Advantages and disadvantages of project-based uh, organization uh, include the advantages of clear responsibility and uh, authority uh, for projects, improved communication within the project because the members are typically assigned on a full-time basis, high level of integration as all functions are 
represented on the project and work together from the beginning. And disadvantages include that uh, the project uh, isolation in terms of their project team members may not feel uh, to be part of a larger community of functional colleagues. Consequently, the project members may find themselves not having a career path uh, in their field. There may be a lot of duplication of efforts because, because of lack of coordination uh, in various functions across different projects. The matrix organization is a combination of functional structure and the project structure. As a result, the matrix organization provides many of the opportunities and challenges associated with the functional and project organizations. The main a feature of the matrix organization is the ability to integrate areas and resources throughout an organization. Moreover, people with specialized skills can be assigned to the project either on a part-time or a more permanent or full-time basis. In this organization, each project team member will have more than one boss. Uh, leading to the possibility of confusion, uh, frustration and conflict, uh, and, and mixed royalties. The functional manager will be responsible for providing many of uh, the people and other resources to, to the project, while the project manager is responsible for coordinating these resources. In short, the project manager coordinates all of the project activities for the functional area, while the functional areas provide the processes to carry, carry out those activities related to their function. Advantages of and disadvantages of their, this organization? Well, the advantages include high level of integration of various functions, improved communication, and improved uh, project focus. The disadvantages include higher potential for conflict because of having two bosses, one being your functional boss and the other one being the uh, project manager. Uh, poor response time because of more bosses uh, usually get involved in responding to any, uh, any questions. Projects can get their resources internally from within the organization or from outside. There are a number of considerations for determining whether to use a, an internal or an external resource. Uh, some of the questions that, that we need to answer uh, when making that decision is that is the, this skill or function strategic to organization? Will this skill be needed in, in the long term, say in uh, five years from now? Uh, would it be cost effective or quality effective to have the research resource internally? If it is determined to consider outside resources, there is a spectrum of outsource, uh, outsourcing options for a particular function, say, IT infrastructure. On one end, we can go all the way to full outsourcing, in which case providing project resources, project processes, or the responsibility of the external source. Offshoring is the outsourcing of jobs overseas. This type of outsourcing allows an organization to take advantage of cheap labor by procuring a product or service from a supplier that operates in another country. On the other end, we can fully insource all project resources, in which case project resources are acquired internally. The project team is responsible for all project processes and delivery of the project. Or we can do selective outsourcing, 
in which uh, case uh, some project resources are acquired internally and the project team is responsible for many project processes. The remaining resources and project processes are outsourced externally. Selective outsourcing provides greater flexibility to select which project processes or deliverables should be outsourced and which should be kept internal. Although low cost is one advantage of outsourcing or offshoring, other objectives should be considered such as increased flexibility or special expertise required for the project. Procurement planning starts by determining what resources you will need to acquire from outside. Then we need to determine how we are going to acquire the resources, when we need the resources, how many or how much of the resources we need. In many cases, organizations send out a request for proposal, RFP, to selected sellers or contractors who can provide the service. A RFP should clearly lay out when and how many resources of what quality we need. After we evaluate the responses to the RFP, we select a seller to provide the service. At that time, we need to negotiate a contract for the service. A contract is a document signed by the buyer and the seller that defines the terms and conditions of buyer-seller relationship. It serves as a legal, legally binding agreement that obligates the seller to provide the specific product, service, uh, or even results, while obligating the buyers to provide specific monetary or other considerations. There are a number of contract types that suit various situations. A lump sum or fixed price uh, contract is negotiated or set as the final price for a specific product or service. On the other hand, the cost of a particular product or service may be fixed with little or no opportunity for negotiations. Fixed price or lump sum contracts may include incentives for meeting certain objectives or penalties if the objectives are not met. For example, an organization may decide to outsource the development of an application uh, to a consulting firm. Based on the project scope, the consulting firm will develop a, an estimated schedule and budget. Both firms may then negotiate the final cost of the project and an incentive to beat the project objectives. If you provide incentives for example schedule, uh, make sure uh, quality standards are well established so quality is not sacrificed to gain the incentive. Another type of contract is cost reimbursable, which can be cost plus fee or cost plus percentage of uh, cost, which reimburse this, this seller for, the, for all the costs plus a fixed percentage fee. The problem with this type of contract is that the seller has an incentive to increase the project cost to increase the fee they receive. Cost plus fixed fee addresses the issue by fixing the fee or the profit of the seller, regardless of the cost of the project. Cost plus incentive fee is a variation that uh, offers an incentive to the seller if they beat certain project objective like cost or schedule. I use this kind of uh, contracting for hiring a general contractor 
for building an office building for Chevron in Southern California. By fixing the fee or the profit that the con general contractor would receive and providing incentives for schedule and cost, the general contractor's incentives became aligned with those of Chevron in wanting to complete the, the project as quickly and as cost effectively while it meets the quality requirement that we had for the building. Time and material uh, contracts reimburse the seller for all the costs of labor, time, and materials that are used uh, on the project, which make them similar to reimbursable contracts. However, in many uh, time and materials or TNM contracts, the unit labor or material uh, unit material costs are fixed, which makes them also similar to fixed price contracts. So what's the project environment? The project environment includes not only the physical place where the team will work and call home, but also includes the technology, uh, the office supplies that project uses. Another part of uh, project environment is the culture within the project. Uh, what is expected of the team members? Uh, what is the role of each team mem members? And how uh, will the conflicts be resolved? The project charter serves as an agreement and as a communication tool for all the project stakeholders. In addition to defining the roles and responsibilities of various stakeholders, the project charter should detail the resources to be provided by the organization and, specific, uh, and specify clearly who will take ownership of the project's product once the project is completed. Any contractual agreement should also detail the terms of all uh, the parties involved. Approval of project charter gives the project team the formal authority to begin work on the project. The project charter should summarize the scope, schedule, budget, quality objectives, deliverables, and milestones of the project. It should serve as an important communication tool that provides a consolidated source of information about the project that can be referenced throughout the project lifecycle. In general, the project charter and project plan should be developed together. The details of the project plan need to be summarized in the project charter and the infrastructure outlined in the project charter will influence the estimate used in developing the project plan. It is the responsibility of the project manager to ensure that the project charter and plans are developed, agreed upon, and approved. Like the business case, the project charter and plan should be developed with both the project team and project sponsor or steering committee to ensure that the project will support the organization and that the project's MOV remains realistic and achievable. The project charter will detail everything needed to carry out the project. This uh, con concludes my lecture on chapter four. Thank you for your attention.